Today, we're very happy to have Jill Sweetman, known as the Brain Whisperer from Sydney, Australia. She is a neuroscience communicator who works in learning and development. And along with Jill, we have Dr. Patrick Quaid. Dr. Quaid is an optometrist at the View Cubed Vision Therapy Clinics in Guelph and North York, Ontario. He's the author of Learning to See, Seeing to Learn, Vision, Learning, and Behavior in Children. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for Thank having you us. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be here. Conversation, let's do the topic of ADHD, a very popular and concerning topic for many individuals, many families. Uh, what do you see as uh, ADHD in the classroom? Is it overdiagnosed? What are the kinds of things that you notice in your practice, Patrick and, and Jill, and the many things that you do with clients around the world? Yeah, I, I think what, what we see in our, in our clinic a lot is when uh, parents bring their children into the clinic and in addition to some visual concerns and academic concerns, we often hear, you know, little Johnny has a tough time settling down in the classroom and especially if there's print put in front of them. And I think um, what's important to note is ADHD is purely a symptom-based diagnosis, right? So, you know, there's certain traits that have to be there. It's basically a checklist. And so there's no, there's no blood test, there's no MRI, there's no objective testing for it per se. Um, so if you actually look in the DSM, it actually says, um, in the absence of other neurosensory disorders, the following symptoms apply for a diagnosis of ADHD. So that's a really important statement, in the absence of other neurosensory disorders. So vision makes up about 40% of the human brain. You know, we have 1.2 million ganglion cells per optic nerve and about 30,000 ganglion cells per ear, just to put that in context. So vision is a very dominant sensory system. It's not the only one, but it's a dominant one. So if that child has a vision issue, there was a paper published in uh, 2005, which looked at 266 kids on medication for ADHD. And, and just for one particular condition called convergence insufficiency, which is when a child can't pull their eyes in effectively to read, they found the incidence in the ADHD group was 15.9%. That's compared to 2 to 3% of the general population. So why is that important? Well, about 65% of the DSM criteria symptoms are also the symptoms that are present when your eyes do not team together. So there's easily a diagnostic confusion between the two. So going back to the, to the DSM, uh, when it says in the absence of other neurosensory disorders. So in my mind, ADHD, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is it should be a diagnosis of exclusion. You should be ruling out everything else first before defaulting to that. Because when we start talking about medication, you know, there's a publication um, authored by, Princeton, Cornell, and the University of Toronto. And it was in the Journal of Health Economics, I believe it was 2015, 2016 paper. And it basically concluded and said, there's no real long-term academic gains by being on the medications. So you look at that and you go, okay, so we medicate somebody and there's no real long-term academic gains. Maybe the child is a little bit more controllable for lack of a better word in the classroom, but that's not really benefiting the child. It's benefiting probably more the teacher. And that's no disrespect to the teacher. I'm sure it's not easy to handle these kids in the classroom. But when we look at that and we say, okay, if we know that, you know, 60 to 65% of the symptoms of ADHD can be similar to symptoms when my eyes don't team together, you know, th those sensory systems need to be checked in depth before we default to a diagnosis, because that diagnosis comes with consequences and side effects from the medications, etc. So mm -hmm. that's what I see from my perspective in the clinic. I mean, Jill, what's, what's your perception on your end? Yeah, fascinating what you just said. And uh, if there's literature to show, as, as my research also shows, that uh, that the medications for ADHD do not indeed support academic achievement. Um, what I notice when I have uh, young people working with me, uh, often they come with, with a label. You know, their parents or their teachers have sent them and they're very quick to tell you that the child has ADHD. I don't want to work with a label, firstly, because I don't choose to work with a limitation. I'm looking at the child's potential. But I'm fascinated when I have children, uh, and, and this is almost to a child. There has been the odd child who genuinely has ADHD, and I, I fully concur with that, and I acknowledge that. But when they're working with me, they are asymptomatic. I don't see the, the manifestations of the criteria. They are gorgeous people, totally focused. They're able to hold eye contact. They're having a conversation with me. And I become very concerned when I hear so many parents say, or the child will tell me themselves or, or the, the adult, I have ADHD. And yet when I work with them, 
uh, it's it's not present. Um, in terms of research, Patrick, to support what you just said, there's a recent article uh, that was published in JAMA Network Open by um, some Australian researchers from the University of Sydney and Bond University, who did a literature review of the last 40 odd years, well over three, almost three and a half thousand papers. And of that, the, the major concern was, yes, that ADHD is overdiagnosed around the world, not just in, in certain areas. And of course, depending on who, who does the assessment, uh, how, how low or how high is that bar? So we're getting more children that are being diagnosed with ADHD and therefore being given medications. But the interesting thing was, and it's not just their paper that um, makes this point, that for those people who have mild symptoms of ADHD, who are on medications, that in fact gets in the way of their reading scores, their mathematics scores, and the, the, the benefits are, are, are not um, supported. In fact, it's damaging to them, not just socially by having a label um, and perhaps being put in a disadvantaged school, but they, they, they're having medication that they don't require. Yeah, and I think you also have to look at, and, and in that same review, which is a wonderful paper, um, they, they also talked about side effects that we often see, like weight loss, appetite suppression, nutritional problems. Um, and, and although there was split evidence either way, there was actually a paper in there that talked about increased rates of suicides in, in some age groups of children. So, right. you know, when, when you're prescribing a medication like an ADHD medication, it's, it's, it's not a minor medication, right? So to your point, I mean, when we go back to the visual world on my side, when I see a child whose eyes don't team together, so when they look at a page, sometimes they see double, sometimes it's blurry, sometimes it's clear. Well, go figure why that kid can't concentrate for long periods of time in a classroom. Um, we had a kid probably about a, about a month ago, and it was quite, quite interesting. We determined that he saw double. And when, when, you know, as soon as we figured it out and the mom was in the exam room, the mom said to the kid, he's about nine, said, why didn't you tell me? And the kid turns around without, me, without missing a beat and says, well, I looked over at my friend's page and his was double as well. So I thought he saw the same way. So, so you look at these kids and it's like they are this if someone lives in that visual world to them, it's normal. So this is why that, that opening sentence on the DSM is so important in the absence of other neurosensory disorders. So we have to be really sure that we're picking up those eye teaming issues properly and treating them accordingly. Uh, Patrick, that's so true. And, and also in the paper, it disturbed me enormously to read about suicide, but also that the paper, paper spoke and not just that, some of the other literature mentions that particularly in, in young girls, that they become they're more unhappy and they are depressed as a result and i had a beautiful young girl a, a short time ago 15 year old who was very bright and she had the very good sense to say to me i'm not happy being on the medications can you please talk to my mother mm. now the mother didn't want to get her off the the medications because she was a bit tricky at home and she'd mm. been given the medication by by a psychiatrist and I thought, well, this child is telling me she doesn't like the side effects and she's excessively bright. Um, I didn't, I felt that she, she perhaps didn't need to be on that. So um, there's, there's so many things to discuss around this. Plus the fact, you know, we have a generation today, the world over, where young people are anxious to a point where they're clinically anxious. You know, I don't think there would be a, or very few mm -hmm. children today in a classroom that wouldn't feel that they had some level of anxiety. I'm wondering why that is. I'm wondering yep. why that is. Yep. And I think I think also when you factor in uh, that North America in particular, uh, Canada and the US, we prescribe more methylphenidate than the rest of the world combined. That that says something. Yeah. Yeah. And yet it doesn't have to be. And this is where I feel that when children and I feel that those that I have that have um, so-called labels and whatever label that is, but we're talking ADHD right now, when they know they have an adult who cares for them, is affectionate towards them and genuinely wants to hear from them and to further their learning, I can't help but think the spirit of that can override many medications that don't have to be given to those children. 
Absolutely. Very powerful. Well, this has been great. Thank you for a great conversation on this important topic and so many more things that we can talk about. We've been joined today by Jill Sweetman, the Brain Whisperer. Uh, you can visit her website, learn many more things, lots of good resources there for you to enjoy and to learn. And also Dr. Patrick Quay, who's the author of Learning to See, Seeing to Learn, Vision, Learning and Behavior in Children. Thank you both for making it an interesting conversation. Thanks for Bye. having us.